so today we'll be talking about mechanics. Uh, this all should be review of stuff that you had learned before. Uh, so I'll actually be throwing out some questions to you all and asking you to define some things to, to check how good your memory is. Uh, it should be fun. Before we get started, uh, wanted to keep going with the, the having people introduce themselves. Uh, last week we had Nelson, Benjamin, and Anya. I don't know if I see Anya. Uh, this is the downside of me learning your names is I can call you out when you're not here. Uh, <laughs> so uh, if we could get maybe three-ish people uh, who want to introduce themselves, say what they're interested in and what they hope to take out of this class. Volunteers. What's your last name, Ben? Oh, Ben Mary. Mary. Yeah. And renewables and failure analysis? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> what kind of failure? class to be taking. Okay. I'm also Ben I'm also interested in sustainable energy I'm more interested in getting better with Python or MATLAB. So the mechanics and materials is cool too. Well there will be plenty of opportunity to get better with Python or MATLAB. Uh, it's not, I get like, we'll have like one or two lectures talking about it, but a lot of it will just be kind of self-guided learning, uh, yeah. for, but, yeah, there will be plenty. <laughs> uh, one more person? Um, I'm Brian, and I guess I'm interested in like aerospace, and I am interested in learning about how to like actually do calculations on material stresses like factors of safety and stuff, because I'm doing Hyperloop, and I'm seeing how to use What's your last name, Brian? Powers. Powers? Okay. Uh, okay. Cool. All right. So, let's get into lecture topics. Oh, did it switch over? didn't switch over. Cool. I woke my computer up and it didn't switch over, which is a good sign. Okay, so uh, talking about mechanics. So mechanics, uh, you should have all taken some number of physics courses at some point on, on mechanics uh, in the physics context. So mechanics is gen as a field of study, um, the, the study of how bodies respond to forces. So uh, Mechanics, which is how bodies respond to force. So in this class specifically, we'll be looking at this in a slightly narrower context. Uh, we won't really be looking at acceleration or kinematics. We'll, we'll be specifically seeing how forces affect materials and, and their deformation. So uh, it's kind of a, an applied mechanics in a sense, uh, but we'll be using lots of ideas. Basically everything boils down to F equals MA uh, at one point or another. Um, so uh, there's, let's go through, uh, so you should have seen uh, in, in at some point, hopefully at some point, um, the, the response of a material to an applied stress. So uh, if I have a body, say, some shape here, and I apply a uniaxial tensile stress to that body. Um, let's draw this out like this. Um, I apply a uniaxial tensile stress to that body with some force F. Uh, this initially has some length L naught, some final length L, some initial width, um, 
and some final width, some initial area, some final area. Let's call this an A, let's call this a nut. Let's call this an A. This is a O. Let's put that on the other side. Uh, w, W naught. Um, if I measure how that body displaces in response to that force, I'll get some sort of what we call a stress strain curve. So uh, here I will get something stress strain. There'll be some elastic response, some potentially non-elastic response. Um, this could end up being full, uh, or it could not. So uh, we're here when we apply a force and measure stress and strain. Uh, force here we're defining, or stress here we're defining relative to the force. Um, so let's roll back a sec. Uh, there's two different ways we can define stress here that we'll that we'll talk about: engineering and uh, true stress and strain. So for engineering. Uh, engineers like to make assumptions and approximations. Yes. Uh, engineers like to make assumptions and approximations. So our engineering stress strain is a the simplest possible definition of stress and strain, which is uh, I'm going to take my force F and I'm going to normalize it by my initial area. Um, and for engineering strain, I'm going to take the change in length uh, between my specimens, so the length before minus the length after, and divided by the initial length, uh, which is also a delta L over L naught. So here, that area is going to stay constant. That length is going to stay constant. Um, what I end up with, if I have here a brittle material, uh, is it'll kind of come up and break. Uh, if I have a ductile material, it'll come up, generally come up to form. There might be some, some drop uh, in the stress after a certain point. Uh, and this will be our engineering stress strain. Uh, we can also look at stress and strain as true stress and strain. Um, so let's make sure that you can all see this. True stress and strain. Uh, so our true stress and strain will will chain. We'll still use our, our sigma as a as a factor and designate it with a t. Now I'm going to define this as the force over the instantaneous area, and true strain, I'm going to go into it in a little bit of depth. Uh, now what this means is as I deform my part, I, I'm instead of just taking it with taking my, my stress relative to the reference area, I'm taking it to a changing area. And so this can, this is always a, a true definition for stress in a material, but it's sometimes hard to measure, uh, particularly when you start to get necking in a part. So our engineering stress is very convenient, uh, particularly for uniaxial tension tests, which is a very common way of, of testing materials, because I don't have to worry about what's happening in the material. So um, this could start doing loop-de-loops as I pull it, and my engineering stress is still exactly the same. Uh, my true stress, however, if I start getting, say, a necked region in the middle of the sample, all of a sudden the, the true stress in that region is changing because the area is changing in that section and it's not changing uniformly across the part. So the true stress is no longer uniformly distributed in there. Um, and a similar idea, um, I can define my true strain now. Uh, I, for true strain, I, I, I want to look at the strain kind of at an infinitesimal location. So uh, same with how area can change at a different uh, position. For true strain, what I'm going to actually do is look at a very narrow section of my part, some li for for a part of length l, uh, and I'm going to say my my true strain, epsilon true, uh, is the 
delta L I over L1, so let's say delta L1 plus delta L2 over L2 plus all of these delta L N over L N. Uh, so I'm going to take the sum of all of these little infinitesimal pieces of strain in here. I can write that as the sum from I equals 1 to N of delta L I over L I. Uh, because we're engineers and we like taking approximations and moving things around, uh, I'm going to pretend that this sum is infinitesimal and turn this into an integral. So now this is the infinitesimal change in L over the length uh, from, from my, I'm going to start at some initial length L naught to a final length L. Uh, this then, I can end up, oh. there we go. Uh, this then, I can say, is a natural log of uh, take integral of 1 over L, natural log of L from L to L naught. So I'm getting natural log of L over L naught. Uh, which is also equal to my, I can now uh, take this relative to my initial strain uh, or my engineering strain, where my engineering strain was here, delta L over L or L over L naught minus one or minus L naught over L naught. Uh, so I can also say that this is natural log of one plus my engineering strain. So uh, hopefully these are familiar definitions. Is there anybody who hasn't seen these before? OK, cool. Um, good to know. Uh, so the difference between engineering stress and true stress takes into account the fact that the part shrinks as you stretch it? Yes. What does true strain take into account that engineering strain does not? The fact that the parts deforming more, more largely or more in localized regions of the specimen. So similarly, so if I, if I have a dog bone specimen um, that has a necked region, uh, let's move this over. Uh, in this Necked region of the sample, which you remember last lecture I showed the aluminum that had necked before failure. Um, the engineering stress and strain in this section is the same as the engineering stress and strain in this section because we just ignore the fact that the area is changing. There's actually a ton, a ton of strain here and a lot of and the stress and a lot of stress here. So, what this looks like now in in our stress strain response, if we were to calculate it using the true area instead um, or the actual area instead, is here, I would have uh, my force kind of continuously increasing. So this now would be a true stress strain response. So actually, this drop that we see in, in normal engineering stress strain curves is because we're not accounting for the fact that area is re getting reduced. So often, this drop here is due to necking in the sample. Cool. All right. Um, so from this stress strain curve, uh, at eventually in the class, we'll start talking about some of this plastic behavior. Or we'll start talking about the larger uh, finite strain behavior. Um, for the first ooh, few weeks, we'll primarily be talking about things before yielding. So we'll be only be talking about stuff up until that point where, where the onset of plasticity starts. And then we'll actually talk about what plasticity is and what happens after, um, after it starts initiating. Um, as a side note here, uh, we're assuming in this case that, or kind of implicitly assuming that there's no rate dependence. Or we're kind of ignoring the fact that this property actually depends on how fast I pull it. So uh, second week, third week, third week, I think, 
Uh, we'll talk about viscoelasticity. Actually, I'll have one of the TAs and come and give a guest lecture on viscoelasticity, um, where he'll talk about how when you change how fast you pull this material, you can actually get a strain rate effect. So the, the stiffness and the strength and the overall response can change depending on how fast you pull something. You can think of this, uh, it's particularly pronounced with like a, like a silly putty, oh, which I have and I didn't bring. Um, I'll show a demo when we talk about viscoelasticity. Uh, but for silly putty, if you have some at home, I would do this demo. Uh, if you pull it really slowly, it kind of just mooshes out and, and stretches out into a long string. If you pull it really fast, it cracks and it breaks into two pieces. And so it's very stiff, uh, or not very stiff, it's stiffer when you pull it fast, and it's liquidy when you pull it slow. So that's a very pronounced viscoelasticity, um, but we're ignoring that in some of these assumptions, uh, and we're ignoring anything past this onset of plastic behavior point. Is that yes. behavior that's pretty much common in all or most materials? Viscoelasticity? To some degree, yes. Uh, it's more pronounced in polymers and rubbers, uh, biological materials, not super apparent in metals and ceramics, although technically it does exist. Yes. Cool. Questions on things up to there? Hopefully not. Okay. Uh, so now I, I, I was going to go through and, and define a whole bunch of elastic constants for you all. Uh, Young's modulus, shear modulus, Poisson's ratio, and I figured that wouldn't be super interesting. So what I'm going to do instead is have you all define them for me. Uh, so switch over to this one. Uh, I'll start off sort of easy and give you. Let's see where it wants to go. Uh, did it show up? <coughs> no? Oh. Come on. Maybe not? Whatever. It'll be pull everywhere stuff. So, um, once my laptop wants to connect. There we go. Cool. Pull everywhere stuff. Okay, so for the first one, I'm going to give you part of a definition. And I'm going to ask you what's missing from that definition. Um, I'll give you, let's say, a minute to think about it. Um, or mm, let's say 30 seconds to think about it, and then 30 seconds to talk to the person next to you to see if you can get the same answer. Also, as a side note, for uh, I'll be counting some of these for participation credit. I don't actually care that you get a right answer. If you if you just throw in a gibberish or a question mark, that's also totally fine. Um, this is mainly to make sure that you're staying awake and trying to be engaged in class. Okay. Okay, uh, 30 seconds, turn next to, turn to the person or people next to you, tell them what you think is missing, why you think it's missing. But I guess the elastic <laughs> 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 Okay. So, what? There's a there's a whole bunch of answers. Did you get on? Yeah. No, it's nothing. Okay. I'll we'll try it. Hopefully for the next one it'll pop up. Okay. So what was missing from that definition? Who wants to volunteer? There's a whole bunch of answers up there. I'm sure you talked about something. Um, it 
it's only the ratio of the stress frame for in the linear region. Yes. Yeah. So that's a very important caveat. Um, so, uh, we're only looking at stress strain in this part of the curve. And I'm also going to tell you now that this def that these definitions are something of a lie. Um, every, everything in engineering is an approximation. Um, so if you think about this in terms of materials. So if you have uh, metals being held together, um, let's say I have atoms uh, that are getting pulled, those atoms um, don't have a linear potential between them, actually. So um, if I were to actually look at the atomic level at the, the repulsion or the attraction between the atoms, there'd be some behavior like this where really close together they'd repel each other so they push uh, far apart they or when they're getting pulled away they attract each other and they want to be in some intermediate distance at some intermediate distance between each other um, so when I'm pushing and pulling on things there's some approximately elastic behavior in there but really the the larger strain isn't going to be elastic um, in an actual material there's also grains there's going to be some plasticity. Things are actually going to be deforming in that linear elastic region. Um, so, so it's not going to be perfectly elastic. So, so when we say elastic, we say it's, uh, we deform it and it recovers back to its initial shape. That's kind of our, our assumption for engineering elasticity. That's never strictly true. Um, for a polymer, you can also think, um, if you remember our, our molecular spaghetti that we had talked about last week, um, you have polymer chains that will kind of bond and slide against each other, um, which at a small force and small displacement is approximately linear, but it's an incredibly complex process. So actually in stress strain curves, uh, in real stress strain curves, sigma epsilon, you may see behaviors like this, uh, Sorry, so, molecular spaghetti atoms, uh, atomic propulsion, they want to be at some intermediate um, R distance. Um, in actual stress strain curves, um, you could get some sort of a, there we go, uh, of a nonlinear region initially as the sample grips tighten on there. Um, or as some plasticity happens or some things settle into place, you could get a behavior like that uh, where it's never actually perfectly linear. This is really common for polymers. Um, it could be kind of zigzaggy as you go through. There's going to be noise in this data. So, so that idea, that concept of, of perfectly linear elastic behavior is very much an engineering approximation. And this is part of what you'll be looking at in that first tension lab um, is saying, well, I don't just have a perfectly straight line. What do I do with it now? Yes. How accurate is the elastic in, um, uh, assumption if you have like an infinite cycle life uh, for some, like, something that you can just kind of do over and over again, like with a polymer or something like that? So the only thing that's close, the, the closest thing to a perfectly elastic behavior is actually with a glassy material. So either glass glass or with uh, metallic glass because there are very few plasticity or deformation mechanisms. Um, and they also correspondingly have very high fatigue cycle life, um, interestingly. But um, yeah, that's uh, a kind of a rare exception. Yeah. Um, so there are materials that are almost elastic. Um, that also corresponds to um, You've probably all heard of coefficients of restitution. Is that a familiar is a word phrase? Sounds Maybe. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So for physics, when you know, when I drop something, how high does it bounce back up? Um, there's a really cool experiment. Ooh, that I could pull up, but I'm not going to waste the time. Um, where if you take a steel ball bearing and a metallic glass ball bearing and you drop them on uh, on a sub on a puck on a metal puck, 
uh, the steel one kind of loses speed pretty quickly and, and stops, and the metallic glass one just kind of keeps bouncing over and over and over and over. Um, they actually used metallic glasses, so uh, I'm going to go on tangents because I <laughs> like fun tangents. Um, golf club heads uh, are, pr are materials where you want a particularly high coefficient of restitution, so you want very little plastic deformation, which most metals have. Um, when metallic glasses started to be made at larger scales, uh, like the early 2000s, um, they actually started making golf club heads out of them, and they performed so much better than every other golf club head, they ba the PGA banned them because <laughs> they were, they were going to put every other club manufacturer out of business uh, who didn't have metallic glasses. So now they actually put an upper bound coefficient of restitution of golf club heads, like, like 0.94 or something weird. Um, Random trivia. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, for the next one, I'm going to have you guys actually go and define some constants. So, uh, you can think about it for a minute uh, and then talk to your partner for a minute. Uh, or, let's say, Think about it for 20 seconds for talk, for 40 seconds, however you want to split it up. And, it, and again, a question mark counts as credit for, for counting participation. So, who wants to give their definition for Poisson's ratio? This is something you learned at some point and maybe forgot, but I'm going to kind of dig into how well you remember your mechanics. Who wants to explain why we get a Poisson's ratio? Not all at once. <laughs> Really good. So, um, I'm going to switch back to uh, our projector. Having you guys think about this also is convenient because then I can draw stuff out. <laughs> um, so, Poisson's ratio, or whenever you pull on a material, um, if you have a homogeneous isotropic material, so uh, let's define those. Homogeneous means it's uniform throughout the part. Isotropic means the properties are the same in every direction. Uh, a composite is uh, heterogeneous because there's fibers in there, so you can't pretend that it's the same everywhere. And it's anisotropic because it's stiff in the fiber direction. So most of the time we'll be pretending we have homogeneous isotropic materials. Uh, but when you pull it, uh, generally it'll thin out. And the ratio between those, between how much it thins to how much uh, it's getting stretched, is the Poisson's ratio, uh, designated with a nu. So it, it looks like a V, but it's actually a, a squiggly V because we like Greek letters um, a whole lot. So uh, Poisson's ratio for a homogeneous isotropic material can actually theoretically exist uh, between negative one uh, to 0 0.5. So what that means, uh, 0 0.5 is the material is uh, incompressible. So when you can think about it as a, as a volume conserving thing. So if I, if I pull my material out, then half of it is going to get squished in this way and half of it's going to get squished in that way. So it, it maintains the same volume. Uh, rubbers have a Poisson's ratio close to 0.5. Cork has a Poisson's ratio close to 0.5. Uh, and then negative one, actually anything less than one, 
uh, is a negative Poisson's ratio material or an oxetic material. So there's a special word, A-U-X-E-T-I-C. Um, and you can think there's, uh, I, I won't go into too much detail, but you can think of, uh, have you ever seen Hoberman spheres, the, the expando ball toys where you, where you pull on it and it expands in all the other directions? That's a negative Poisson's ratio mater metamaterial. Uh, so, um, yeah. Uh, so, let's jump back to this guy, and now I'm going to have you define uh, shear modulus. Shear modulus. There we go. This one might be a little bit easier. to give a definition for shear modulus. There's a little bit of discussion. The ratio of the shear shear stress over the shear strength. Yeah. Nice. Thanks. Um, so what that looks like if we draw this out. If it wants to pop up. There we go. I realized I didn't actually write down Young's modulus. Uh, Young's modulus, the ratio between the u stress and strain in a uniaxial tension test. Shear modulus now is if I apply a shear stress tau to my material, um, I get some shear strain gamma, and my shear modulus uh, G is the ratio between those two. Sometimes uh, shear modulus is also defined as a, or u mu, mu is used as the symbol for shear modulus. Um, they're kind of interchangeable depending on where you look. If you see one or the other, don't freak out. They're, they're the same thing. Sorry, is gamma a length or an angle? Uh, angle. And remember that these are all uh, grossly exaggerated in terms of yeah. deformation, too. This is actually less than like 0 0.1 degrees, or, um, less than like 0.1% strain for the uniaxial case. Okay, uh, then the last one, I'm going to have you guys define bulk modulus. This one is a little bit trickier. Maybe not as tricky as Poisson's ratio, but... Start popping up for you, also, or is it still not? <laughs> oh, Never heard of it. <laughs> oh, for God, that's okay. That's what this class is for. I don't actually get any of the responses on my screen. I have to look over to the projector to see it. Um. Okay, who wants to define bulk modulus? Maybe 
less sure about this one. Less sure than Poisson's ratio? Any takers? The ratio of isotropic pressure to volume change? Uh, yeah. So uh, the definition is a little bit weird, but yeah, it's a material's resistance to volume change with hydrostatic pressure applied. Um, so the reason it's weird is because we can't quite as easily define change in volume as we do uniaxial strain or shear strain. Um, so the, the actual written out version of it, um, we have, ooh, let's draw some arrows on things. Uh, if I apply a hydrostatic pressure P to a block, uh, so the same pressure in the x, y, and z directions, uh, its volume is going to change. And uh, bulk modulus is defined as the volume times the relative change in pressure, or the change in pressure relative to the change in volume. So it's a little bit of a weird definition, but generally, yes, it's, it's the, the resist material's resistance to hydrostatic pressure. Um, cool. Okay, uh, so for all of these isotropic material constants, or for all of these uh, elastic constants, isotropic, homogeneous, uh, linear elastic material constants. Sorry, so with the dp, dv, um, would dv be like in some sort of absolute term, or would that be like a percentage change? Uh, so you would have pressure as a function of volume, uh, and the rate, the rate at which that pressure changes with respect to changes in volume is that dpdv. Oh, sure. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. I don't know if that actually made it clearer. Okay. Okay. It's, these are also all somewhere in the, in your textbooks and online and a whole bunch of sources. So, can you record the lectures? Where are those on yeah, so on Canvas, I, I post the module that we're in, which will be, uh, it'll correspond to the chapter that I'm working on. So right now we're in chapter one in my notes, which is intro to mechanics, intro to materials. Uh, I'll post the videos to YouTube and then link them on the Canvas module pages. Uh, so uh, Canvas has a limited storage space of like two gigabytes. So videos immediately wipe all of that. Uh, yeah, but there's YouTube links in the Canvas page somewhere along with lecture notes for each class, in case you can't read my handwriting or want to go through it in a little bit more detail. Cool. Uh, so uh, we're already running way out of time. Uh, so with these elastic, also uh, bulk modulus uh, K, it's also sometimes defined as B, um, like used interchangeably, just a heads up. So with these isotropic linear elastic homogeneous material constants, um, it turns out all you need to know, is they, they all relate to each other. And all you need to know is two of them to know all of the rest of them. So um, if I know my Young's modulus and my Poisson's ratio, for example, I can figure out my shear modulus. So let's say relation, ships, um, now G, move this down a little bit, G is related to Young's modulus by uh, 1 over E over 2, 2 times 1 plus the Poisson's ratio. Um, my bulk modulus is related to these uh, by E over 1 plus the Poisson's ratio and 1 minus 2 times the Poisson's ratio. Um, nope, that's the that's not the right one. Just kidding. Three, three times one minus two times the Poisson's ratio. Um, there's actually a fun elastic constant called the Lemay parameter. Um, Lemay uh, constant, which uh, I'm going to define for you now. It's it's. Uh, it turns out to be really useful because it makes writing out uh, Hooke's law super simple. Uh, but 
it's the ratio between if I have a material confined between two plates um, or confined in a body and I apply some strain epsilon x to it uh, then I have some corresponding um, sigma y. Lemay's parameter is defined as the ratio between those two. So it's the ratio between um, negative uh, sigma y y epsilon x x. Let me double check that um, to make sure I'm not lying to you. Uh, oh, there's a positive. Just kidding. Um, but this also relates to Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio as um, E over, this is the 1 minus nu 1 plus 2, 1 plus nu 1 minus 2 nu. Um, there we go. Cool. Um, so that one we'll see pop up when we define Hooke's law. Uh, it's it's kind of a, a, a use, it's useful actually for soil mechanics when you have confined body problems. Um, most of the time, it, it doesn't. It, it's a kind of a weird physical thing to think about. Whereas Young's modulus and shear modulus kind of makes sense. This one's like oh, I'm a confined body and I'm applying strain and I'm getting a reaction force. Um, yeah, but uh, it's a cool one. So. Uh, I'm going to save strain energy density for uh, maybe tomorrow because we have lectures every day. But this week uh, is the start of labs. So I wanted to talk really briefly about the photoelasticity lab. Yeah. So for stress and tension is positive? Yeah. Uh, tension is positive, compression is negative depending on what type of experiment you do. If it's only looking at compression, you can define as positive as well. But if you have both, yes. Okay. Tension is positive, compression is negative. Um, so lab starts this week. Uh, this week it'll be on photoelasticity. So um, I'll, this uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I'll also probably post the first homework maybe sometime today, tomorrow. Uh, for the homeworks, I, I'm expecting them to take about an hour, maybe two, uh, or that's what I'm aiming for. Uh, and so if you forget to do it and you realize it's due when you get to class, it'll be like 2% off because you can do it after class. Um, yeah, but um, I'll be sure to send an announcement when I post the first one. So uh, photoelasticity, uh, how many of you have actually heard of photoelasticity before? couple people. <laughs> cool. So this is kind of a, a niche technique that used to be used really prevalently and now has kind of fallen out of favor for DIC, uh, digital image correlation. So photoelasticity uh, is when you have certain materials that you and you apply stress to them, you actually get a change in uh, refractive index depending on what the, what the stress is in the part. Uh, and so what that ends up with is you can get materials that display uh, fringe patterns depending on how much you stress them. So if I take, uh, normally this is with transparent materials, so plastics, uh, some glasses, which is also why it isn't used as commonly anymore because it's a very limited material set. Um, but you can actually physically see where the stress contours are. So here now, uh, the h there'll be some neutral plane that hasn't changed stress, which is which will stay one color. and uh, you can count basically the number of, of fringes that go through the material to see how much stress is being applied at different states. And uh, for one fringe, that's an ISO stress contour. So everything that's within that one fringe is, is the same stress. So uh, your TA Santos will talk to you about it in lab in a little bit more detail. Um, I wanted to talk uh, really briefly about why it happens, uh, conceptually at least, before you jump into it. So photoelasticity is, is predicated on the concept of birefringence, which is uh, the highlighted word in the theory section. So what that means is when I have a material 
uh, it can have different indices of refraction in different directions. So uh, if I have light going through that's polarized this way versus light that's polarized this way, one can travel faster than the other. So uh, that happens in photoelastic materials or materials that exhibit a photoelastic effect when you apply stress. So changing the amount of stress changes their index of refraction. Um, and so what you do experimentally is you apply circularly polarized light. So the light wave is kind of rotating as you're going through. Um, and then light that's going through in one in direction of maximum principal stress versus the di direction of minimum principal stress, uh, which how many of you remember principal stresses? A little bit. Uh, we'll talk about it later on this week. So we can actually go through it in a little bit more detail. But uh, depending on the direction of max principal stresses, the light will either go faster or slower. And then because it's circularly polarized, uh, the slower light will actually create an interference pattern with the faster light. And you'll get kind of wave interference uh, with that circularly polarized light. Uh, so what photoelasticity experiments do is they take a light source, they circularly polarize it, put it through a material, uncircularly polarize it, and then project it against a screen. And so you'll be able to see kind of in real time uh, what the what the stress contour is in, in this case, we'll be looking at uh, a straight bar and a curved bar. Uh, so tomorrow we'll talk, uh, we'll start going into beam bending theory. Uh, for those of you, most of you have seen it, there's a couple who hadn't. Um, so we'll go through the theory for that. There's one equation you'll need to use for it in this lab, uh, which we give to you here. Um, so don't worry too much about it if you don't know the theory. Uh, this is also what accounts as extra credit. Um, but yeah, photoelasticity in general is, is kind of a cool thing to see because you get to visualize stress in real time. Um, and so I wanted to at least have you all exposed to it, even though it's not used as commonly in engineering practice today. Um, I also have first office hours today, uh, 224, just around the hall, starting at 11, if anyone wants to stop by. Otherwise, I'll see you all tomorrow.